Blumstein, um departamento de ecologia e biologia evolutiva na cidade da Califórnia, em Los Angeles. É, o professor Daniel vai falar em inglês, então quem está com seus equipamentos de tradução, coloque nos apostos. Uh, I'd like to thank you, Daniel, for accepting the invitation for this productive week of us here. Thanks for having me. Um, I will try not to speak too fast, and hopefully the translators can keep up. They've been doing a good job before. However, um, I have a lot of text on these slides, hopefully, so if you can read English, that will help a little. So what I want to do today is talk about sort of an ongoing um, story, problem, um, path I've been taking where I've been trying to integrate behavioral ecology uh, into wildlife management. And I want to start by, um, by, by really saying why did I sort of begin thinking about this and, it, it, and, and what's my background sort of perspective and philosophy, if you will, on this. And I'll say that it's modeled off um, our national, the U.S. National Institute of Health's um, idea of um, from bench to bedside so that you can be doing primary research and you can, ask, you can then try to use that primary research in the National Health Institute to influence health, but primary research also can influence potentially wildlife management. Now, in the best of all possible worlds, we don't need conservation behavior. We don't need to do, to, to solve um, problems of single species because that's really the realm of conservation behavior. In the best of all possible worlds, we have ecologically inspired management that saves species. But in many cases, we have a population problem. We have too many of one animal, we have too few of another animal, and we want to um, modify um, populations. And in that case, that's really the role of behavior. So research that takes fundamental insights from behavioral biology and applies them to conservation problems um, is, is and wildlife management problems is really what I'm going to be talking about today. And I'd like to suggest that a theme of this really is that we need to have mechanistic studies, studies that understand the levers that um, control animals um, and, and link those levers to population biology processes. And that's going to give us the ability ultimately to predict how animals will respond to our, the things that we're, we're doing. So this is a shameless plug for a book that Esteban Fernandez Yersik and I wrote um, that, that talks about <coughs> conservation behavior. And if you're at all interested in these ideas, um, this is our primer of conservation behavior, and it has a variety of topics. And much in the spirit of this book, which has lots of ideas, maybe some solutions, maybe not, um, what I want to do today is I want to go through lots of ideas and, and, and begin getting you thinking about how one can go from here's something really interesting in theoretical behavioral biology, but here's a link from behavioral biology to conservation biology or wildlife management. So I'm going to be saying a lot and a lot of stories here, and the idea is to get you thinking about how one might do that in your own discipline, in your own special area of focus if you're interested in. And I'm going to say that all of this, this whole discipline, this whole field, conservation biology generally, should be based on, I think, evidence-based decision making. Whenever you have a wildlife management problem, you have a very clear objective, you're trying to solve something, and there are many ways of potentially solving that problem, and you want to make sure that um, you're using the best possible evidence to do so. And a very effective way to implement that is through adaptive management. So adaptive management can be active adaptive management, where um, you design experiments and track the outcomes and modify what you're doing based on those experiments. And experiments are great, but sometimes it's not possible to do an experiment. So in many cases, um, managers end up doing passive adaptive management, where they use historical data or data from uncontrolled experiments to come up with best guess management recommendations and the fate of which might be adjusted based on the evidence. And that's fine. You can do an experiment, it's much better to do an experiment. So when I go through and talk about a variety of topics today and ideas that I've got and su I'm suggesting, view all of these as testable hypotheses that may or may not work in any given situation. But they're hypotheses and they might be useful. So I'm going to talk about a lot of things. I'm going to talk about flight initiation distance, how close you can get to something before it moves away, and as, as a metric to quantify human disturbance. I'm going to talk about the evolutionary ecology of fear. Why, why do animals not tolerate people? 
I've been fascinated by the fact that you put a hiking trail in a park and you start losing species. How can you predict which species will be lost? Why? Um, I'm going to talk about some ideas about how we might ask how and where animals may fear, uh, feel safe. There's a whole geography of fear that we need to understand better. I scare things. Um, so you know, I'm going to talk about fear a lot. But, but animals feel safe in certain areas. And you know, how do we understand that? How do we map that? How do we understand the geography of this? And then I'm going to talk about some ideas that are, I think, potentially generalizable ideas. And I think that as a theoretical behavioral ecologist, we want to come up with explanations, generalizations, models of life. So I'm going to talk about anthropogenic noise and something I call the distracted prey hypothesis. I'm going to talk about natural history of habituation and something I call the contiguous habitat hypothesis. And I'm going to talk about the multi-predator hypothesis and the evolutionary persistence of behavior. So buckle up your seatbelts, let's take off. <laughs> so why study anti-predator behavior? You know, what is anti-predator behavior? Things animals do to reduce the probability of being detected by a predator or attacked by a predator or killed by a predator are all aspects of any predator behavior. And this includes adaptations to detect predators, identify them, any predator vigilance may be important in this, escape from predators, um, flee them, hide from them, use refugia, and communicate about them. Um, why would you want to study any predator behavior? Well, there are direct effects of predation on populations and communities. Predation, we know, can be a very strong selective force. It's going to influence habitat selection. It can influence population persistence. So for example, I spend most of my time these days studying marmots, <coughs> large brown squirrels. We'll talk about those tomorrow. Um, and it turns out that local populations go extinct if there is not good visibility. So um, uh, you can have population, metapopulation extinction based on predators can drive metapopulation extinction. And understanding what those key factors are can help understand uh, the habitat that's required for these sorts of species. There can also be indirect effects of predation risk in populations and community. Fear alone can influence where animals go and what they do. Fear alone can structure communities. And then, you know, predation has often been implicated in wildlife management failures. I was in Brazil um, in, in uh, 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 November, and I um, had the great fortune to visit my friend and colleague, Carlos Ruiz Miranda, who introduced me to the very successful Golden Lion Tamarind project. The Golden Lion Tamarind reintroduction success story is one of the best conservation behavior success stories. And it's also, and it, it was because the re tamarinds were being released, they were all being killed, and they said, well, let's think about what they, and starving, let's think about what behavioral problems there are that can be applied to this. And it's a, it's a wonderful success story. It was really cool to go out and see them. In many cases, um, animals are being reintroduced or translocated to recover a population. And it's in, in many cases, this is one of those key areas where behavior can be important and knowledge behavior can be important. Okay, so we know that humans change animals' behavior. And I, I would suggest that a key to understanding how humans impact animals is to view people as predators. Predators approach animals, animals flee and hide from them. So why do some species tolerate disturbance while others don't? Flight initiation distance is the distance at which an individual flees an approaching person. It's a method to um, quantify perception of predation risk, and it's a method that can be used um, to aid wildlife management. I developed a comparative data set that has about 300 species with about 10,000 flushes where assistants and I would walk towards birds and, and scare them um, and, and, and use this to ask a, a variety of questions and still use this to ask a variety of questions. Now, one of the insights that was important to demonstrate, which is obvious to anyone that goes out and looks at animals, but hadn't been statistically demonstrated until this point, is that flight initiation distance can be a species-specific trait. Um, this is uh, uh, looking at flight initiation distances for some birds outside in, in Sydney, uh, Botany Bay, outside Sydney, Australia, uh, right under where the airport is. And we looked at different species um, at different locations around the bay that had different degrees of human disturbance. Some of them were protected areas, some of them were public beaches, and you can see that generally 
um, species that are flighty at one location are flighty at another location. This says that even though flight initiation distance is a very adaptive, plastic trait that varies very dynamically within individuals and within populations, there's still a species or there may be a species specific signature. And that opens the door towards asking comparative analyses or doing, asking comparative questions using formal comparative analyses. So in one um, series of analyses, uh, we sort of discovered that it turns out large body size birds detect approaching humans at greater distances. Body mass, it turns out, is the best predictor of flight initiation distance in many, many analyses. Um, here I'm plotting <coughs> phylogenetically independent contrast values um, in a comparative perspective. So if you want to know, you know who's going to be disturbable, big species are disturbable. This was not because larger species had larger eyes. In a data set that I looked at, I did not find an effect of eye size on flight initiation distance. In some other data sets that other people have looked at, they are finding um, eye size may be part of this. Larger birds um, flush at greater distances. Did I say larger? Birds detect humans at greater distances, and larger birds also flush at greater distances. After controlling for body mass and starting distance, um, turns out the distance you start walking towards something influences um, how, how soon it will flush as well. Birds that first reproduce at an older age are more flighty. So there are some life history traits that are important in explaining species differences in um, disturbability to, to humans in this case. There were no effects of some other life history traits or habitat characteristics. Um, we looked at uh, the um, clutch size. We didn't find an effect of clutch size. We didn't find an effect of the number of days young were fed. We didn't find an effect of longevity. And we didn't find an effect of habitat openness. But species, um, other analyses demonstrated that flightiness co-evolved with eating live prey and being a cooperative breeder. Eating live prey, why might that be? Well, if you have eyes that can detect movement, um, maybe you also detect other things. And sociality um, involves vigilance for lots of things. If you're a social species, um, you have to look out for others, and you're nosy about what others are doing, or maybe you're worried about someone coming up and you know, beating you up or something. So it seems that there may be carryover effects or syndromes of sociality that have consequences for, in this, in this case, any predator behavior. In another series of studies, we looked at um, fences and the effect of fences on flight initiation distance. And we did this by going to an area um, and, and looking at the same species. At, so Southern California has very few remnant wetlands. So there are these wetland areas um, are very few. Some are protected, some aren't protected. Many have been built on. One particular wetland um, was an area called Bolsa Chica. Bolsa Chica was a big ecotourist area. There was a hiking trail around Bolsa Chica, and many, many people go there to look at birds. The other half of Bolsa Chica wetland, same place, was an active um, oil well. So oil companies had the area fenced, and very few people went into this area um, because they were actively pumping oil. It turns out that 60% of the US's oil is left in California, which uh, is a statistic that just became, I just realized, um, which is insane. I had no idea. In any event, this is an area, the same wetland, same contiguous area, but there's a fence. And then, um, a couple miles away, um, there's a naval base that stores all of the weapons for the Pacific Fleet, and no one goes there. So we got permission to go there. We were thrown out after 9-11. We got permission to go there. And this was an area where very, very few people went. If you look at the number of people we detected um, while we were looking, you know, very few people with these two areas and a lot of people with this area. So then you can say, well, how does bird flight initiation distance, um, how's, that, how's that correlated with that? What we find is that um, for these four species of wetland birds, um, we found no significant differences in how they responded in either the fenced area or an area where no one went, and they responded quite differently in areas where there were a lot of people. They tolerated closer approach. 
Now, the really important thing is this fence, same birds, same birds were moving all around this area, it looked like. Um, uh, the fence afforded safety. Fences are management tools and can, be, uh, can influence animals' perceptions of risk. Now, typically when you walk towards something, many, many data sets show that a direct approach is more threatening than what's called a tangential approach. A direct approach is, I walk straight towards someone. A tangential approach is, I'm walking by someone. But in both cases, um, you're getting closer to a particular person. With colleagues in, in Argentina, we asked um, a question <coughs> in these high alpine grasslands where um, there was a lot of visibility. Birds could see everything. What we found for four species was that in these open areas, peripheral or tangential approaches were actually more alarming than direct approaches. So each of these graphs plots um, alert distance, the distance an animal looked initially at a person, and flight initiation distance. So we're, we're looking at relationships here between when, when that bird detected someone and when they flew away. And what you see is that um, the tangential lines are the dotted lines and the direct lines are the solid lines. And what that means is for any given alert distance, there were systematically greater um, tangential approaches led to systematically greater flush distances, which we didn't expect at all, um, and uh, suggests a testable hypothesis about visibility and habitat structure. Turns out that some birds are more wary when more people approach them. Um, so, you know, you don't always go out bird watching or, or looking at animals alone, often it's a social activity, and you can ask the question, you know, is, is, uh, is a group of people more disturbing than not? And for crimson rosellas in Australia, um, two people are more disturbing than a single person, but geometry doesn't really matter. If you're side by side or back to front, it doesn't really matter, but two people are more disturbing. Um, in terms of looking for generalizations, I kept seeing in these data sets that um, flight initiation at starting distance, the distance I started experimentally approaching animals, seemed to be really an important predictor of flight initiation distance. And I sort of um, initially, tongue in cheek, suggested that this is a rule of behavior. Well, it turns out we just got this published yesterday um, that, that animal, I mean, animals generally seem to flush early and avoid the rush. And in this phylogenetic meta analysis of many studies of flight initiation distance, the effect sizes um, range from 0.7 for mammals to 0.66 for birds, um, lizards that you approach very slowly, 0.2, or lizards you approach rapidly, 0.59. It's a general generalization that as you start walking towards something at a greater distance, it's more disturbed. So if animals can see you at greater distances. If people or ecotourists are going out there and looking at animals at greater distances, they can have a greater effect on animals. So, you know, these are a bunch of theoretically inspired questions. Let's just remember what the implications for conservation and management might be. I think this, is, this, this research has stimulated other studies that have used flight initiation distance to study life history trade-offs and risk-taking, and I think it's a, it's, it's a good technique to do that, and other people have generated some other really interesting insights. I would predict or expect, hypothesize, that larger birds and social birds and those that eat live prey are going to be especially vulnerable to human disturbance. I'm going to say that more people are likely to be more disturbing, that indirect approaches may not necessarily be less disturbing, particularly in areas where animals can monitor um, you know, people, where there's really good visibility. The Amazon is very different than a beach. Um, and that some results from individual-based models suggest that larger birds, which are more easily disturbed, have lower expected fitness than smaller birds and that I think there is a need to develop and parameterize with real data these individual-based modeling approaches. We need to parameterize models with real data and apply these to real problems. Now, my great frustration in the US is that you know, if you study human health issues, you get money from the National Institute of Health. If you ask you know, evolutionary questions, you might get money from the National Science Foundation, but they don't have any money. If you ask a very applied conservation question, um, you might get money from a manager. But this sort of research fits, falls between all of those gaps. It's conceptually inspired, theoretically inspired 
management research which tries to come up with generalizations that may be useful for lots of situations and no one wants to fund it. So it's, 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 really, it's really hard to do this stuff. So we make lots of noise. Um, and we know from a growing literature um, that, that um, this anthropogenic noise may mask biologically important signals and it may change um, uh, signal structure. Birds particularly may sing over or under um, anthropogenic noise uh, to, to, avoid, to avoid things. Noise may create physiological stress. Um, you know, buses going by, animals that live near highways, closer to roads have more stress than, than, than not. Same thing for people. Um, population distributions may be affected um, by noise. And noise can directly harm animals. Think of the incredibly loud sounds that people are using in the oceans, well, the US Navy's using in the oceans, um, can directly harm, harm animals. But loud noises can directly harm other animals too. They're hearing or, or blow out their swim bladders or whatever. So there, these, are, these are concrete examples of how noise can, anthropogenic noise can influence animals. It turns out, I think that there's another idea out there too, or something that requires a little more thought. And I'm going to call this the distracted prey hypothesis. So any stimulus that an animal can perceive is capable of distracting it by reallocating part of its finite attention and thus preventing it from responding to an approaching predator. The main point is that attention is finite. You can't pay attention to multiple conversations going on at one time. You have to focus on one individual that you're communicating with. You have to focus on maybe on some biologically important things. And if something distracts your attention from those biologically important things, it might have a biological consequence. So the idea is that attention can be um, compromised by external anthropogenic stimuli. And it turns out those can be in multiple modalities. So if I'm doing this, or if someone starts taking their clothes off behind me, you're probably not going to be able to pay as much attention to me. So anything that an animal or we can perceive in any modality potentially can distract it. And if it's distracting it from some biologically important task, like trying to detect and avoid predators, it could have a demographic consequence. So birds and mammals and reptiles and invertebrates all use attention to focus on relevant stimuli. This is a, you know, if, if, if you're alive, if you're an animal, you, you, there's attentional processes. So we've developed hermit crabs, terrestrial Caribbean hermit crabs, as a model system to study distraction. And instead of flight initiation distance, hermit crabs pull back in their shells when they get scared. So we're going to talk about hiding initiation distance. First experiment um, was a study where this, this emerged from a student um, project on a field biology course that I teach. And they said, we want to know if motorboat noise influences uh, hermit crabs. I'm like, OK, why? And they said, we don't know. And I said, well, let's think about attention and distraction and whatever. And they said, oh, that's a good idea. So we designed some experiments, and, and, and um, we used uh, the playbacks of motorboat noise. And um, this was an area where, at the time, there were very few motorboats. This is in the Virgin Islands. And uh, at times, there's many motorboats. But at this time, it was a low tourist season, and there weren't any motorboats. It was, it was a quiet time. So we walked towards the, these hermit crabs. We had a silent approach. And we um, added noise, or we added what I call the disco party mode. We added noise and a strobe. So the first thing we found is that crabs can be approached closer when boat motor noise is broadcast. So we do a playback of boat motor noise, and we can approach closer to the crabs before they hide in their shells. And it wasn't just um, uh, maybe you know when we're walking towards an animal, we're 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 we're, we're vibrating the ground or something. So we created. Um, there actually, this, this, this shirt um, had a cla it was a Clash t-shirt. So basically we swung a Clash t-shirt towards these uh, poor crabs. No vibrations, no movement, and it was this looming object um, that had the same sort of an effect. When the boat motor noise was broadcast, that looming object could get closer to the crab before it, it hit. And then we had the disco party boat, and we added a strobe. Um, in addition to the noise and the, 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 you know, the boat plus the lights allow us to get closer to the, the crabs. Um, so then we said, let's bring this into captivity. 
And here we're looking at uh, latency to hive, and we have an LCD monitor, and we have an expanding scary stimulus. Um, <laughs> this, this bird worked really well. Um, and it, it's a similar sort of thing, but we can control everything because now it's in captivity. And I mean, th these, are, these are findings that predict, first principle predictions, that the duration and amplitude of stimuli should also influence the magnitude of distraction. And it seems to. So here we're measuring this as the latency to hide from a looming predator. <coughs> and we find that um, uh, short sounds uh, versus loud sounds, short sounds, uh, the latency to hide um, is shorter, meaning short sounds are less distracting than loud sounds. And the, I'm sorry, short sounds are less distracting than long sounds, and loud sounds are more distracting than quiet sounds. So the magnitude of stimulus should influence response, and it does. Um, but, but this is what, what, might one what, what you might predict, but it sort of shows that you can begin to really clue in on ways to, to think about attention. Okay. I, I like being an ecotourist. I'm sure if you're a biologist, you like being an ecotourist. We go out and we take pictures of things. And what I don't quite understand is why digital SLRs have a sound with them. But they do have a sound with them. So I mean, when I used to take pictures, I had a mirror and it made noise and big clacks and shutters. But digital SLRs can be really quiet. But they still have a shutter, a mirror that goes up, and they still make a sound. So um, you can ask, do camera sounds scare animals? So we were looking at brown and oles in the Caribbean, and we did a playback experiment where we had silence, and we had a banana quit singing, and we had a kestrel call. So it turns out that many species respond to the sounds of their predators. Um, and that's probably a wise thing. If an animal knows the predator's around because it's communicating with other predators, um, it, should, it knows there's a higher background risk of predation. So many species, either through learning, um, some evidence for that, or even in some cases through some innate predispositions, are able to respond to the sound of their predators. Here we're looking at changes in display rate. So in this particular experiment, lizards you know, are sort of sitting on a tree and they're head bobbing or uh, moving their, their, um, their, their um, dewlap in this case. And um, if you look before a playback experiment or after a playback experiment and compare after minus before, you get a change in display rate. So banana quit is a little Caribbean bird that doesn't eat any lizards and they're very common and if banana quits are singing, it looks like the lizards like to display. It's probably a good thing if banana quits <coughs> are singing. But if you play back the sound of a kestrel, a predatory bird on lizards, um, they, they, they reduce their display rate. So then we did a, a playback experiment with um, uh, the sound of uh, a shutter. And because this initially was designed as a multimodal experiment, we actually thought that sound wasn't going to be important. We thought that the flash would be important because lizards are very visual animals. Um, turns out it doesn't really matter. Sound or sound plus flash lead to the same response. Um, they suppress their display rate. And they just suppress it in a way very similar and in a magnitude similar to that created by a kestrel. So take only pictures and leave only fear. <laughs> so, you know, we think we're doing benign things, but actually, you know, we're, we're, we're probably scaring these poor guys. There you have it. So, um, I think there's a full employment scheme for studying the natural history of habituation. I think we know a lot about habituation. I think we've known a lot about habituation for over a century. Habituation in general is a decline in responsiveness um, to a particular stimulus, repeated exposure. Sensitization, by contrast, as repeated exposure leads to bigger responses. But we know nothing about the natural history of this. We know nothing about the conditions um, under which animals are more likely or less likely to habituate or sensitize. We don't, and in some cases, animals sensitize, in some cases, they habituate. I'm going to come back to that sort of through two ways of thinking about this. First question is, can ecotourists impair survival? Dictics are these little African ungulates, about this big. And they're monogamous, and they're terrified. 
about 36 species of, of things eat dick dicks. So you go out and you drive around and you find this little pair of dick dicks sitting there quivering. Because that's what they do all day, they quiver. Because there's 36 things on the savannah that want to eat them. So assessing risk to dick dicks is really important. And as I said, many species respond to the sound of their predators, and um, we're interested in looking, this is again was a student project in the field biology course, we're interested in understanding how they responded to their predators. So we broadcast jackal calls, jackals eat with dicks, and birdsong. And um, we also wanted to look at the effect 